Hello, yes, that's right, it's Joe here for Joyrider TV live from the Wild Wind Workshop where miracles take place on a daily basis. So as you will know, we're here for a live Q&A, that's question and answer session where you guys can ask the questions and hopefully I'll be able to answer them in a satisfactory manner. Um, if you do happen to be watching this later on, uh, so not live, then I will still be able to answer your questions, but you'll just have to put your questions into the comments below and then I'll respond to those questions in next Friday's Q&A. Just going to give this a little tickle. Oh, yeah. There we go. All right. So, um, yeah, I'm coming to you from Wild Wind Sailing Holidays uh, on the Greek island of Lefkas, where we've had um, variable amounts of champagne sailing conditions this week. Uh, but um, today is actually the last day when it hasn't, well, one of the only days when it hasn't been pretty decent double trapezing uh, cat sailing weather. So very nice indeed for all involved. Um, as always, I've also got some preloaded questions, which um, I'll be going through. So everybody who has put a question up in the comments from last week or in various other videos, I will be responding to. There we go. I'm just get it. Uh, where are we? There we are. And here we No. Yes. No. All right, so I'm just going to kick off with a question from Hanny, who is one of our regular regular visitors to us here at Wildwind. Hanny is uh, coming from the Netherlands, uh, Holland, and she's got a question, which is, uh, what is the best way to sail over the waves, making the experience as smooth as possible? Now, there's a few... Uh, things which are going to influence how smoothly the boat is going to go over the waves. So this all comes down to uh, what is largely known as the five essentials. So the five essentials, if you've never come across this term, is in order of importance, in fact, first one, course. Which way are you pointing the boat? Um, so Let's go into how to steer the boat better um, if we are sailing uh, with some waves. So um, if we, here we go. So we've got waves like this. Then if we were to be sailing, so we're going in a straight line up the waves, um, if the wind was in such a direction, to allow that, what would happen would be if we now have a side view of one of these waves like this, a bit of an exaggeration, of course. If we go straight into that wave, what's going to happen is when we get to the top, the front of the boat. This is a terrible drawing. Apologies. Um, it's the first one of the day. The front of the boat is going to come out of the water making it when it comes to a certain point, it's just going to slap down the other side, making it quite an uncomfortable kind of very much like a rocking motion as you pass over the waves. So that would be if you took a route straight through what is known as like this, that would be a poor route because you'd be coming up the waves, slamming down the other side, not very pleasant at all. Whereas if the wind did allow you to sail in this direction, like if the wind was like from over here, then much better would be as you get towards the wave, just towards the top of the wave, just to bear away a little bit. And what that's going to do is just as you get to the top, it's going to put a bit more load onto the bows of the boat 
pushing the bows over the top rather than allowing them to lift as you go out of the top. So you'll just bear away slightly at the top. That's going to push down. You can then head up again, going down the other side and then just repeating that motion. So you're kind of snaking your way over the waves, just bearing off slightly at the top, forcing the bows down and having a much smoother ride. Um, if the wind is quite light and you've got some sort of wave action, then if you're sailing up, we'll just talk about sailing up wind. If you are trying to sail as close to the wind as possible, then you're really going to feel this kind of rocking as you pass over the waves. So you're going to have a much smoother ride if you just take your boat off the wind a few degrees. Again, generally, so rather than going this way, if you were just to come off a few degrees like this, your boat is going to be tracking much more nicely. And it's going to be, again, just sticking to the water much more rather than getting tossed around by the waves quite as much. Um, the other thing we could look at in our five essentials is the trim on the boat. So um, the trim on the boat is where are we going to sit, uh, maybe more towards the front, more towards the back. But again, we're trying to keep the boat, as much of the boat in the water as possible to make it smoother. So perhaps what you need to be doing, especially if it's not so windy, is get further forwards on the boat. So we're kind of digging the holes into the water more, especially as we get to the top of the waves. There we go. That is what I've got for you there, Hanny. I hope that helps. I hope you're getting some good sailing there in Holland um, until it's time for you to come back here the next time. Um, great to have you on board as always. All right, we've got I Love Windex. How's it going? Great to have you on board. We've got Chris there in Texas. Howdy, partner. Is that what they say in Texas? Um, yeah. Always nice to see you, Chris, in the live chat. Panos is on board as well. Panos down in Patra. I think he's going to be visiting us soon here in Vasiliki Bay for some of this champagne. Whew, that's a tidy drop. All right. Hello, Richard. Oh, we've got Jeff. It's been a long time since Jeff has been in the live chat, but Jeff is from gearreport.com, uh, a very fine resource for anybody who is into a bit of outdoors. Uh, they do a lot of reviews for um, any outdoor equipment. Check out gear-report.com. Uh, Jeff says, finally going sailing tomorrow. Been a rather dry summer. Know the feeling. Yeah, uh, personally, actually... Here at Wildwood, I haven't done half as much sailing as I did last year. Just it seems the workload and there have been various things that have been cropping up, which have been preventing me from getting out on the water. So I know the feeling. Uh, we've got Kevin there. Nice to have you on board, Kevin. We've got Eggy in Hungary. Thanks for tuning in. And we've got Benny in Sweden. What's going on, Benny? Benny says, hope to join you 10th of September. Great stuff. Looking forward to that. And we've got Scott there in, uh, I believe, Coltus Lake, Indiana, uh, who we saw in the last um, show, as your cat, with those fantastic new whirlwind sails on his 16. Scott says, morning to the Joyrider community. Hope the wind is blowing dogs off chains in September. I'm Vasiliki bound to give it the beans. Oh, yes. So Scott is going to be dropping it in to the Vasiliki slot in September. And historically, September is one of the windier months. And we will be running the September speed stick competition here in Vasiliki. So anybody who can make it out here, bring your GPS device and give it the biggest beans that you've got available. And off we will go. We've got Lee there in Macon, Georgia. USA. Nice to have you on board, uh, Lee. 
All right, we've got uh, Peter also in the Netherlands. Hobie Cat 17, Sailor. We've got Kevin. Kevin says, hi, all. And then uh, we've got the other Kevin in. I had a fellow from South Africa tell me that the 14 was never designed to tack. It was designed to run straight to shore and jump the waves. Would you know if that's true? Well, I wouldn't know if that's true. But I tell you what, it sounds, I think that it sounds like there could be an element of truth to that story. Because as anybody who's ever set on foot, set foot on a Hobie 14, especially one that didn't have a jib, uh, which the original 14s didn't, um, to tack one of those requires such intricate technique that you could believe that the 14 was not designed to tack, uh, just to run it up the beach, turn it round, push it out the other way. But um, yeah, I couldn't actually say whether that is true or not. Um, I'd be making it up if I said anything. All right, so let's return to a preloaded question. And here we go. So I've got a question here, which is from Judith. Uh, this is in response to the video that went out probably about six weeks ago when uh, the jib block broke and uh, I lost all of the rig tension on the boat making it extremely difficult to tack. Uh, this was on a Hobie 16 where uh, the rig only has any tension on it through the jib halyard. So without the jib, you have no rig tension. Um, and Judith asks, is the whole weight of the mast solely supported by the jib on the Hobie 16? What about the forestay? Good question. Um, on my catamaran, the whole weight is supported by the forestay and the jib is put around the forestay. Uh, just what was going on there? Okay, it's a very good question. But um, yes, on a Hobie 16, the only purpose of the forestay is to hold the mast up when you haven't got the jib up. Um, of course, the forestay, like uh, in the example of that video uh, is quite handy because if the jib, like perhaps if there was a problem with the jib or with the jib halyard, the forestay will actually prevent the jib from falling down completely. But yes, on a 16, the jib halyard holds the master, which is why firstly, the jib halyard on a Hobie 16 needs to be of a very high quality rope. I bet, I would be willing to bet that there are many of you out there sailing Hobie 16s, perhaps even Hobie 16s from the 70s or early 80s, who are still using the original jib halyard rope. Yeah. Um, and, you know, perhaps having a 30-year-old piece of rope or even older 40-year-old piece of rope holding the rig tension on your boat, perhaps it is worth replacing it. So with the jib halyard on the modern 16s, modern meaning from, when would it be? Something like early 90s. Um, what we have is these jib blocks like this. Um, so this would be the top one, which shackles on uh, to a pigtail on the forestay. When we're talking about a pigtail, what we have is if this is the forestay and that goes to um, an eye in the forestay, which attaches to the mast, a pigtail, as Hobie Cat call it, is a short piece that extends down and then you've got a second eye. And then what happens is that block will attach on here and then if we have it so that the jib is up the second block attaches here so we'd have this one like here this one like here and then we've actually got a purchase system 
that we pull the jib up so we can get it really tight. Now, you should be looking at using, I've, I've changed my tune a little bit here because I always used to say a five mil rope, five millimeter rope with a Dyneema core is enough. But we've started using six millimeter rope uh, of a with a Dyneema core just to absolutely make sure that there is zero stretch in the jib halyard. Uh, your jib halyard, incidentally, if anybody's thinking I'm going to get a new jib halyard, if you're using this sort of system, it should be 21 metres long. So um, a high quality Dyneema cord rope 6 mil might be something like, I don't know, $2.50 per metre. So that would still be under $50, maybe about $50 to put a new uh, forestay on your boat, a uh, jib halyard on your boat. And that's going to last you about 10 years, I'd say. So well worth the investment there. Now, what exactly happened on that day out on that Hobie 16 when the, we lost all tension? Well, it wasn't the rope that broke. It was actually one of the jib blocks. Boom. So these jib blocks are very strong. But what we found is after, I don't know, what year are our boats? So our boats are 2014. So after um, whatever that would be, eight years, the jib block gives up. So and that's for us. And we're using the boats every single day of the week in the summer. And a lot of the time that's in quite strong wind. So that is what's going on there. Oh, also, thanks very much to Hanny. She gave me this cup. It's a beauty from Delft in Holland. All right, we've got Mason on board. Hello, Mason. Okay, Mason asks, which is not fun for you Hobie 14 or Hobie 16 that is a fine question now um I find both the 14 and the 16 very fun indeed um it just depends on the scenario like if the wind is like 25 knots and I'm sailing single-handed then the 14 certainly delivers more fun than the 16 because in that wind with the 16, you're just trying to dump power all of the time because for one person on a 16 in 25 knots of wind, like I'm about 90 kilos and that's just not enough weight to be able to keep the boat um, in the sweet spot. Yes, you can take it down the mine shaft and absolutely send it, but it is a bit much. Whereas on the 14, the 14 is, of course, designed as a single handed boat. So it's much better suited, especially in the high winds, to be out there giving it some serious juice. Uh, the biggest beans down the mine shaft, mowing the lawn in the strongest wind possible, because that is what it's designed for single handed. Whereas I think for the best fun sailing experience for me, um, between the two, the 14 or the 16, I'd say the Hobie 16 to, with two people um, in sort of between 25 and 30 knots, then that is absolutely cooking. And that is when the fun really starts being more fun, I would say. But um, it just depends on the day who you've got available to sail with and all of that. Thanks for the question. All right, we've got Cole on board from Colorado. Great to have you on board, Cole. Thanks for tuning in. We've got Thomas on board in Cologne, Germany. I think Thomas will be here pretty soon. All right, Lee says, I acquired a Hobie Mama Bob for my 1982 Hobie 18 with a heavy aluminium mast. All right. Just for anybody going, what on earth is a Hobie Mama Bob? These 
bobs as uh they're described in america they're not called bobs in uh europe if this is your mast it's basically a big plastic kind of looks a bit like an airship that sits on the top of the mast so this would be the sail here and what it does is it will stop the boat from going upside down if you were to capsize. Very good piece of safety equipment, um, especially if you've got a very heavy aluminium mast or if your mast is prone to leaking or if you're sailing in very shallow water, definitely. Um, Lee continues, uh, the, it, when he got the, the, this mast float, uh, it has a float, a rod, and a couple of pins, but no mounting hardware. Any recommendations regarding the proper mounting hardware? Ooh, I've never actually been involved with putting a um, masthead float on a Hobie 18. So I'm going to have to ask the community here, are there any Hobie 18 sailors out there who could send some pictures of their Hobie 18 masthead float and how it attaches to the boat. Um, if you have got any pictures, then if you could email them to me and then I will um, get those through to Lee or perhaps just make a short video showing pictures. This is how it works. I'll do a bit more research on that as well, Lee, so that we can get your bob fitted onto your 18. Got Toot there in Texas. Great to have you on board, Toot, as always. Cheers. I love Windex with a very good question. What is my favourite type of bean? Crikey. That is a massive question. Now, I would say my favourite type of bean at the moment in the current climate is what is called out here in Greece, gigantes, which, all right, this is going to require a picture. If we were to take a normal size baked bean, it would be like this. Then one of these gigantes beans um, would be like this. Massive. And that is how we go that little bit faster by having bigger beans than everybody else. Thanks for the question there. All right, we've got Ward on board. Hi, Ward. Ward says, what would be a normal angle of attack for a NACRA F-16 sailed single-handed? So if you're talking angle of attack, I am guessing that you're talking upwind upwind sailing course so there is some sort of method in how to really pin in your upwind sailing angle and this is going to go with your telltales on the mainsail So if this is our mainsail and what we want is some telltales in the body of the sail. So as well as these telltales on the leech. And what we're going to do is we're going to pull the main sheet in tight and then sail the boat so tight, pulling the main sheet in tight. And then we're going to sail the um get to an angle where the telltales perhaps not the most the highest one but the second one so if we've got our battens here so perhaps in or around the panel of the sail that has the insignia um so we want to get those telltales in this panel so that they're flying correctly. But rather than trimming the main sheet, 
so that they're flying correctly, we're going to use these telltales to determine the angle that we're going to steer to. So when we're steering to the telltales, so pull the main sheet in tight. If it's a lighter wind, you're going to want to have it slightly eased. Now, I can't define exactly what slightly eased means in this context, but from pulling it in tight, maybe just easing half an armful, that is about right for the light winds. And then let's say, like on the, um, if we've got our two telltales, so we've got the one on this side of the sail and the one we can see through the sail, if the telltale that we can see through the sail, so the one on the leeward side, I'm just doing them the other colours, um, if that one's not flying straight back, so if it's going upwards like that, that means we need to steer the boat closer to the wind. So you'll steer the boat nice and slowly closer to the wind until that telltale comes straight back as well. And then if the telltale on this side of the sail, this red one that we've got here, if that one starts lifting, then that means we're too close to the wind. So then we need to steer a little bit away from the wind to get that flying straight back. So that would be in the light winds. As the wind increases, this is actually exactly the same story for if we were sailing with a mainsail and a jib and we were steering the boat by watching the jib. Um, so as the wind increases, let's just swap these rounds so they're the same. So firstly, and most importantly, the outside telltale. Can we see that? Just about. The one we can see through the sail should never be doing anything other than going straight backwards. Because if it's doing anything else, it means you're either oversheated, your sail is in too tight, or you're not sailing close enough to the wind. And then as the wind increases, this inside telltale can be allowed to start to lift. So when it's just trapeze, or perhaps just enough wind to start to lift the hull, then we can allow this telltale to lift. When it's enough wind to trapeze, we could have it lift a little bit more. Um, and when it's um, enough wind, that you're really pulling on all the controls to flatten the sail, to start really dumping power, then we can pretty much disregard the telltale. And then when we get to that much wind, we're just sailing the boat by feeling that balance between pointing and boat speed. So if you're sailing really high, but you feel the boat's hardly moving, then perhaps you are too high so you just take the boat off the wind just a few degrees. So we can't be more scientific about this. And then that will be the sweet spot in the stronger wind. I hope that helps there, Wood. Um, yeah, sorry for the lack of science on there. But um, get the sail in and then just keep watching that telltale there and just keep it flying until the wind starts getting strong. And then we're just sailing more by feel when the wind gets stronger, cranking in as much main sheet as we possibly can. All right. And Thomas says to Hanny, hi, Hanny. He's got a song request. Nothing else matters. Very good choice. A bit of Metallica from 1991, I believe. Uh, very good. Uh, we've got BJVDB on board. Thanks for tuning in. Who says, hi, Joe. Our NACRA 6.0 from 1992 didn't come with a spinnaker. Would you reckon it would be worthwhile to make one our ourselves or just get a newer model? The jib on the 6.0 is already quite large and low. Yeah, this, the NACRA 6.0 was one 
of the big, powerful boats to come out in 92. Um, re a real powerhouse, but with the slightly narrower platform, a bit like the Hurricane 5.9, but with a much more um, aggressive look to it. The um, uh, advertising slogan was NACRA 6.0. It's, what was it? It's a big gun. Oh, what was just for the big guns? I think that's what they said. Um, yeah, I would say if you've got the option to upgrade to something a bit more modern, which has a spinnaker on it, I would go for that option rather than to retrofit a spinnaker to your NACRA 6.0. Um, the 6.0 is already a powerhouse once it gets windy with that big jib. Um, and perhaps it wouldn't be quite so well suited to retrofitting a spinnaker on there. And when you're sort of building your own spinnaker kit for the boat, there is a fair amount of trial and error that would need to take place before you really get it uh, working very nicely. Whereas um, I would say if you upgraded to something like... Um, uh, a NACRA F-18 or a NACRA Infusion, which doesn't need to be tremendously expensive. If you're willing to come away from the NACRA brand, you could look at a, a Hobie Tiger. You can pick up Hobie Tigers for not much money at all. Uh, that would, to put a, a spinnaker kit on your boat is probably going to, if you're getting a sailmaker to make you a spinnaker and then everything else, it's probably going to end up being getting on for a thousand euros. Um, whereas uh, you could buy a pretty decent Hobie Tiger these days for about two and a half, three thousand. So that is something to weigh up there. Yeah. Um, if you want to stick with something that's six meters long, then the NACRA into 20 would be a very good choice if you can find one. Um, yeah, very good boat, loads of volume in the bows, massively powerful, goes like an absolute train. I believe that's got a 25 square meter spinnaker on there. So a very good choice as an upgrade. And that's really going to tickle you. All right. So Kevin says in the US, we call these masthead floats float bobs there we go just so that we're getting all the the correct terms all right two is on board uh uh and he has some experience with uh fitting the masthead float to his boat two sails uh 17 i believe and he says two stainless loops rivet down so what i'm guessing that we have to attach the masthead float to this mast is if this is the mast looking straight onto it then what we have is two fittings kind of like this and then the um the pole so these two fittings would be riveted into the mast like this something like this to uh just let me know how i'm getting on here with this bit of guesswork and then top of the mast then you've got the pole that comes down here through here and then there is our bob on there something like that that's what i'm guessing all right there we go all right cole says i do a lot of single-handed sailing some dab double-handed sailing and i want a hobie 14 or 16 in the future but not sure what is better for this application yeah i would say if you're going to do any double-handed sailing the 16 is the right boat because the Hobie 14 just does not carry much weight, 
particularly well. I would say if you're going to be sailing with more than, what would we say, about 110, 120 kilos. Let's transfer that into pounds. 120 kilos is 0.13 short tons. That's not what we're talking. Um, that's 264 pounds. So if you're going to be sailing with more than 260 pounds on the boat, go for the 16. Um, even if you're going to be sailing it single-handed um, about half the time, you won't be having much fun on the 14, two up, unless both people sailing the boat are very lightweight. There we go. All right, Mason says, did you do any sailing camps as a kid? Yeah, not as they are now. Um, back when I was, um, like, young, there wasn't so much youth sail, organised youth sailing going on. We had, through our school, for one week of the year, there was organised a, um, a sailing week at a local lake where um, I attended that twice. And that is pretty much all of the sailing camps as such that I did. The rest of it was great way of getting into some cat sailing is go to your local sailing club and offer to crew for people. Because um, a lot of the time people buy their boats, but without actually having somebody in mind that they're going to sail it with, so if you put up on your sailing club notice board, crew available, um, and just put some statistics, how tall you are, how heavy you are, how much experience you've got, that is a really good way of getting into some cat sailing, which doesn't involve buying your own boat. All right. All right, Chris says, we're on the beans question again. Um refried beans for the win I'd like to try that who have we got hands what's your favorite type of beans um lentils lentils yeah there we go hands coming straight in with the lentils very popular bean out here um in greece but the refried fried beans i think i might as well as my earlier bean choice i might say the spicy beans that um richard was talking about in arizona i might be in for some of those spicy beans i think that's a good choice all right we've got dave um office hands dave of course who um if you saw the video about the innovative camera mounting solution it was the office hands dave design that we were looking at and he's on board there favorite bean is one uh, is I bean to Vasiliki. Very good. Joe should name Hobie Six number two refried bean. Very good. Unfortunately, um, sorry to say this, Dave, but Hobie 16 number two is not looking too sweet at the moment. She's out of action with some serious gudgeon issues. More, more on that story as the story unfolds. All right. A lot in the live chat today. Thanks to everybody for tuning in. Um, and Dave continues. My Bob recommendation is to leave it off. If you have two people writing is easy anyway. If you have one person, the Bob changes it from difficult to impossible. There is some truth in what Dave says there. If you put the masthead float on the top of your boat, then when you're pulling your boat up from capsized, there is this much more weight at the top of your mast. So it does require a bit more wind to bring your boat upright. But there really are many pros and cons of the masthead float. There are different things you could use for your masthead float as well. It doesn't have to be the standard Hobie um, Bob. I think what I would do if I was... If I was sailing in shallow water and I absolute and I was really keen not to have my mast dig into the bottom, 
perhaps what I would be inclined to do, this would be a collaboration with a sail maker. If we have the top of our sail here, I would get a sail maker to stitch into the top of the sail, like perhaps for the top, what would that be? The top foot and a half to stitch in um, on both sides of the sail, a large piece of foam. So if we looked at the sail straight on, if that's the sail, then at the top, it would just be slightly wider. So a bit of foam stitched into the top of the sail on both sides. That foam wouldn't be as effective as the bob to prevent the boat from inverting, but it would certainly slow down significantly um, the boat inverting, but it wouldn't have this wind, it, wind resistance that you get from the masthead float. And you wouldn't be able to see it so much, uh, but it could make a really big difference. I might even speak to Thanos at OS3 sales and see if he can make us a prototype of this sort of system and see how it works. Watch this space. Exciting times. All right. We have got. How do I pronounce this? Pota troops. Who is in the Philippines? Nice. Great to have you with us there. Pota troops. Uh, planning to build my cat from scratch. Still researching up to now for parts. All DIY. Your channel is really helpful. Still struggling on how to build a traveller. All right. Um, I think to build a traveller, we're in the workshop so we can do this. Bear with me one second. If you've got in the back beam of your boat, if you've got a track already, uh, you're going to need a track if you're going to have a traveller. And then a good style to go for, because these are relatively inexpensive. This is what's called uh, from Hobie Cat, the Trentec traveller car, which is quite clearly a plastic spider where it has a metal tube which holds on the bit where the traveller rope goes through, main sheet shackles onto here. This is very simple. and Perhaps using a Hobie Cat Trentec traveller car is a very good solution. Um, I'm just trying to think if I've got a. Um, no, perhaps not. Um, rather than going for some sort of elaborate ball bearing traveller car, which the ones that we find on like F-18s, Tornadoes, those sort of boats, to buy one of those traveller cars is very expensive indeed and you need to have the perfect track for them to go on otherwise it's not going to run very well so i would say the trentec hobie cat traveler car as you'd get on a hobie 14 or an older hobie 16 it's a good option all right i love windex says how does one read the telltales on the leech of the sale great question let's um put a telltale on the leech of this sail there. So what this tells us, this telltale on the leech of the sail is if we can see it, it means that that part of the sail is not oversheated. So if you have, if we look at the sail from the top, we've had, let's do a slightly better picture of the sail looking down from the top. So there's our sail in red. There's our telltale in black. If the wind is coming over this, if we're like on this tack, so the wind's here, and the wind is, the sail is tuned, is sheeted perfectly for the wind, then this telltale is just going to fly straight back. However, if we pull the sail in too tight,
So the wind is here, let's say. The wind's going to be fine. It's going to be happy up to a point like here. And then it's got no way of escaping. So when it gets to the leech of the sail, hope everybody's following this great diagram. So when it gets to like here on this one, it's just going to go straight like that, which is going to blow the telltale off at right angles to the sail. So we're not going to be able to see the telltale. That's how it works. How do you actually use them? Is those of you who are very scientific are not going to like this, but this is how it is. So what we'd have is several of these telltales, usually three or four. And what is likely to happen, because the bottom of the sail is very directly controlled from the main sheet because it's closer. So what's probably going to happen is the bottom telltale is going to fold around the back of the sail first. So that is the sweet spot. That is what we're looking for with these leech telltales. Um, when the bottom one is folding over, that means we've got the right sort of sail shape. It's opening up nicely towards the top. That is going to be optimal. So that is what we're looking for. You may ask, but why are we using those telltales rather than the ones in the body of the sail like this? It's because on a boat with a taller sail, like on a NACRA 500, for example, like on a Hobie 17, Hobie, um, uh, Formula 18, Tornado A-Class with a tall rig. These are very good because they're easy to see. That is why. And as soon as you look at the sail, you can see them immediately so you know what to do. All right, this stage in the game, just going to take a short commercial break. Oh, yeah. There we go. All right. Oh, remember, part of the commercial break, head over to TotalJoyRider.com if you want to support the channel by getting hold of a T-shirt, a hoodie or a hat. I could do custom designs. So if you've got a new boat with new sail colours and it's not on the website, just get in touch. Send me an email. I'll design this stuff for you and then get it to the printer. The printer will send them out um, and to your house. And I'm using printers on all the different continents of the world. So it's not like if you're in the States, stuff will be getting shipped from Europe. Oh, no. If you're in the US, it'll be coming from the US. If you're in Australia, it'll be coming from Australia and so on. Thank you very much. That was a commercial break. All right. All right. Toot says, oh, OK, we're into the um, masthead float debate. Uh, Toot disagrees. And uh, Toot says he's got uh, masthead floats on his 14, 16 and 17 and getaway and all can be righted solo. OK. All right. Scott says your audio is going wonky like two weeks ago at least for me here in Oregon. Yeah, RJ Fleet agrees the audio is bad. Yeah, I don't know what is going on with the audio, but I'm going to carry on regardless. And in fact, what I'm going to do is crack on with the pre-loaded um, questions that we have here. So the next one is from Pierre, who says... How do you know how to spot a gust? This is a good question because knowing what the wind is going to be doing next is very important because um, what the wind is doing next should really influence your sailing massively. So what we're looking for is when we're sailing, we always want to be looking towards where the wind is coming from 
So if we're sailing like here, the wind coming from here, but we're going forwards like here, rather than looking straight towards the wind here, although there may be gusts coming here, we're moving forwards. So we want to be looking at where the wind is coming from, which is going to be hitting us. So that would be, if this is our eyes like this, we want to be looking up here. Like this, is, this should be our line of sight here. And then what we're looking for, for a gust is a difference in the texture of the water. The way that we can see a gust is it's gonna be, the water is gonna be rougher. So a lot of the time that rougher bit of water is gonna be darker, a darker patch. If it's particularly sunny, then that rougher bit of water might be a shinier patch of water. This all comes with um, just sailing more in one place and you learn how to spot the gusts in one place because in one place you might be looking for darker patches like here, for example, a lot of the time it's the shinier bits which are gusts. So that is what we're looking for. But it's where to look for the gusts so that would be on the upwind. And then if we're sailing downwind, especially if we've got the kite up and we're absolutely flying downwind, the actual wind um, is sort of behind us, like, like here. But to look there isn't really going to do anything. So what we're doing on the downwind is we want to be looking. So here's our eyes again. We want to be looking kind of here. Because this is the wind that is going to be affecting us. So we're always looking at the wind, which is going to be affecting what is going to happen to us. There we go. That is a fine question, Pierre. Thanks very much for there. And uh, got one more question in the preloaded, and then we'll go through what's going on in the live chat. This is from KOQ1. This is a good one. Uh, you could, if every, in fact, even if you're in the live chat, put all your answers to this one in the comments section below, not in the live chat, so that everybody can um, see what your answers are on this one. But what do you? Consider to be strong wind? Ooh, that's a big question. Um, now, what I consider to be strong wind is very much dependent on two things. The first thing is the experience of the sailor. Because for somebody who's just started sailing, strong wind might be, let's say, 14 knots. But for someone who is very experienced in sailing, strong wind would more likely be 25 knots. So it's very much dependent on the person who is doing the sailing. The second thing which will influence what you're uh, describing as strong wind is what is it that you're sailing? Yeah. So, for example, um, an example which is a little bit outside of what we talk about here. If you are on a foiling kite board, strong wind is probably going to be something like, again, 14 knots of wind. And you're going to be like, yeah, this is flipping strong on this thing. Whereas if you're say, if you are 100 kilos and you are sailing um, what would we say, like um, a Hobie, maybe a Hobie wave or something, 
then a strong wind is definitely going to be up there in the 25s. So it's really relative what we are calling strong winds. For me, uh, a definition that I have in wind strengths would be, in fact, let's, uh, let's put it on the board. So, Light winds, both holes in the water. Then the next one. Would be sort of moderate winds flying the hull or um, what would we call that one between moderate and light and then. Then we've got the juice, which is when we are out on the trapeze, lifting the hull. And then strong, strong wind, I would say, is, is this still on it? Yeah. Um, is when we're flying the hull, both out on the trapeze, and we're pulling the downhaul as hard as we can. And perhaps if we're sailing a boat, which we use the traveller on a lot, like 16, we're letting the traveller off and we're doing everything we can to depower. Another consider another definition might be strong wind is when you feel there's a good chance of a capsize. That is what here in, um, in wild wind, that's what we call black flag conditions. And that's when I put my helmet on if I'm not filming. Um, if I'm filming, I'll put the helmet on whatever the wind strength. All right, we've got a lot of chat in the live chat. Let's see if I can go here. Toot says, I'm looking for some NACRAs 5.2 or 5.7. Which is the best choice? Now, to be honest, um, I couldn't really say. I think the 5.7 is a much more performance boat than the 5.2 so if you want higher performance go 5.7 easier to sail perhaps a bit more versatile for single handing and for sailing with a crew the 5.2 all right we're into the quick answers section now and if i could ask no further questions in the live chat please because we'd be going almost an hour now um all right bjvdb is going to look into the Hobie Tiger as well. Great stuff. If it's a good choice. Chris says an F-18 or an into 20 kite will work on the 6.0. The hard point is setting up the pole to work correctly. Yeah, exactly. There's a lot of trial and error involved. All right, Robert K. Hello, Robert. Enjoying your videos. I am looking to give it the beans on my top cat K1, but still missing an appropriate GPS device. All right, don't get me wrong. You can give it the beans without a GPS on board, but will anybody believe you? Yes, they will. Will they? Um, the most straightforward way of recording your speed when you go out sailing is all you need to get is a reliable dry bag for your telephone and then take your phone out with you on the water. If you've got a good dry bag, um, what you could even do is have your phone with you and have it down your top, um, sort of like underneath your top, underneath your buoyancy aid. And then that means it will definitely be with you with like a lanyard around your neck. And then on your phone, you could just use an app like Strava. Um, I say Strava because that's the only one I use. But there's another, there's two really good ones. One is called Strava, which is spelt like this Strava. And the other one is called Relive, um, which Strava actually used to use Relive as well, but that they've um they've become divorced now, apparently. But um, 
Strava's um, good. What you have to do is on Strava, they haven't got a sailing mode, but set it to windsurfing and then it will do your speed in knots. Um, Relive is nice because after you've finished, it gives you a 3D uh, picture of where you've been. If you saw the last episode of Show Us Your Cat, you'll see the guys in um, Haukadiki, Greece, uh, they sent us some really nice relive uh, maps of where they've been sailing. So that's a nice option as well. Or otherwise, there are so many GPS watches available. I know it's a bit of a minefield. Um, so I settled for the Loco Sis, spelt like this, Loco Sis. GW60, and I've had my loco sis GW60 now for about four years, and she's still going strong. And I like that one because it gives many statistics. All right, there we go. All right, we've got Aziz in Egypt uh, on the bean question. Uh, Aziz is into falafel which is the Egyptian um, bean-based, I think like balls made out of beans. Is that correct? Uh, rather nice. All right, Chris says refried beans are pintos that are cooked and then fried with some garlic and other spices. Wow, that sounds pretty good, actually. When I come to Texas, I'm going to be having some of those. All right, Aziz asked the question, how would you go in and out? of the beach in high waves. Ooh, yeah, we've been through this before. Um, I think to do it the most safely, what I would do is invest a little bit of time in some research. Um, so if this is, if this is the beach, Maybe you've got really big waves that come in over here and then it gets a bit smaller as we go up this way. Then perhaps consider just changing your launching and landing um, venue a bit so that you don't need to be going out in big waves. Because even with very good technique, if any of you saw the footage from the Worrell 1000, where there was some really experienced cat sailors sailing up the east coast of the USA, there were some people capsizing in the waves and snapping their masts. So if you can avoid having to sail out from the beach through big waves, that is always going to be the best solution. Of course, it's not always possible. So I would say timing is everything. And to be honest, I haven't sailed out from a beach in big waves so much, but I've done a lot of windsurfing in big waves. And I would say the strategy should be similar. So what you want to avoid, if we do two lines for where the wave is breaking like this, in fact, that isn't breaking and that is broken. Like that many lines. This is about to break. Then that one's breaking. We've got foam here, foam here. Then what you need to do is to avoid sailing up the steepest waves. So the waves are quite unlikely just to be a whole wall of a closeout, unless you're really unlucky, where the whole wave all the way along the beach is just dumping all at once. What you'll generally get is some sections where the waves are breaking earlier and some where they're breaking later. So like this one here might not actually be breaking till it gets in here. So what you want to do is as you're going out, the foam shouldn't be quite so much of an issue. So get through the foam. And then if this bad boy is looking a bit flipping dirty, then just bear off a bit, get away from him, and then just head up 
just off the shoulder. So where the wave um, isn't as steep, get over the wave there off the shoulder and then repeat that process until you're all the way out. And then what you don't want to be doing when you're coming in is kind of like getting barreled on the way in almost on your boat. So where the wave is breaking, this is one heck of a wave, um, you don't want to be kind of in here. So once again, it's the same. Um, in fact, when you're coming in, the safest place to be, if this is a wave, and that's where it's gonna break here, the safest place to be is just kind of here, coming in on the back of the wave, because then you're as far as possible away from the next one, which means you get into the beach, get your boat up on the beach before the next wave's broken or the next wave will break and then you'll only experience that foamy element of the wave and not the dumping element, which could be detrimental to the uh, integrity of your boat. There we go. All right. So... Um, Eggy says, we use boat fenders tied to the top of the mast. We're back onto the mast head floats. Um, as is says, I use a lifesaver, inflatable lifesaver that I attach to the sail. Yeah, so um, like a kind of like a, a life jacket, buoyancy aid attached to the sail. That would be quite similar to this thing that I'm looking at doing with stitching some foam into it. But anything works. Um, to stick up there. Kevin says he used, he has used two empty gallon milk jugs tied to the mast. Doesn't look great, um, but works nicely. All right, just looking through these questions. All right, so um, yeah. So with the uh, response to the what is high winds, if you put it in the comments rather than the live chat, that means that people will be able to see it when they're watching this later. But Chris says uh, strong winds is number one skill set, number two boat and set up, number three location and how much fetch. So how big the waves are. Oh, we've got David on board. Hello, David. Great to hear from you. David is, uh, you'll know David. David is the one who rescued me when I had my real man overboard last year. All right. So just skimming through here. It's almost time to wind this up. Mason says, what would be a lot of wind if you were in a laser? I'd say a laser with a standard sail, probably something like 25 knots would be. Um, in fact, for me, it'd be less than that. If I have to hike out going upwind, then that is um, that is enough. All right. Uh, back on the GPS. Which GPS do you need to take? Uh, Toot says race Q uh, like this. Race Q is a really good app on the iPhone. So there we go. Uh, Robert says, thanks for the info. I'm going to send my beans and get on the leaderboard. Oh, yes. All right. Chris has got another one. It's called Yo Nav 2.0. All right. There we go. So you can check that one out as well. Toot says, when you come to Texas, Come for a visit. I'll show you some good Texas cowboy cooking. Yes, that is what we're talking about. Um, I definitely am into that. All right. And Chris says, when I come to Texas, we'll have a party at the Texas City Dyke. 
which is the best catamaran venue, let's say arguably the best catamaran venue in America, into it. All right. Yeah, we'll organise something when I'm coming to Texas, that's for sure. All right. So there we go. Thanks very much to everybody for getting involved and for their questions. Don't forget to put your favourite beans and what you consider to be strong wind in the comments section below. Uh, please hit the like button before you leave and I'll see you soon with some more. I should have a new video coming out tomorrow, but unfortunately I have been off the water for a couple of weeks now. Um, I should hopefully be back amongst it next week. Uh, you're not going to believe it, but we've got um, on the team here, very skilled drone pilot. So stay tuned to see some absolute sizzling footage uh, coming from Joyrider TV. So thanks very much. I'll see you soon with some more. And I'll see you soon with some more. Thank you very much. And keep those beans coming.